Well, I want to thank you all for coming again tonight. I see the crowd has thinned out a little bit, but I hope to make this an interesting debate for you, nevertheless. And I'm going to pick up right where we left off last night. And last night, I had shown that the Bible does not say that Scripture alone is our authority. There is no verse to be found in Scripture that says such. And there is a very good reason for that. And I just want to use an example that has happened in the last a couple of nights regarding my own last name. All my life, I've had to teach people how to pronounce my last name. To me, it's very simple. It's only three syllables, Sungenis, and it's spelled just like it sounds, but almost everybody I've run across has a problem pronouncing the name. And I'm going to use this as an analogy for why the scripture does not say that it's the only authority. And the reason for that is this. My name could be pronounced Sun Sunjanus, as uh, Ernest did on Tuesday. And uh, he said he did that before he met me, until I corrected him at the airport. Or it could be Sungenis, which is the proper way to say it, and that's what I told him at the airport. Or it could be Sungenis, with the accent on the third syllable. Now, if you didn't know me, and you hadn't talked to me, you would never know which pronunciation was correct. You would see my name, you would see the letters, all eight of them, and you would try to guess which one was correct, which pronunciation was correct. But I'm the only one, and a few of my relatives, that could tell you the exact pronunciation. And this is the same as the Bible itself. There's a lot of things the Bible says, but as you know, in life, things that are said or even things that are written can have multiple meanings. And how do you know which meaning of the viable interpretations of a passage are true? Which meaning is the one that was intended by the author? And sometimes this is a very difficult thing to get to. And the only way that you can really know which interpretation is correct, because you may have a lot of plausible interpretations that sound correct. The only way you can know is ask the author. What did you mean when you wrote so and so? And the author will tell you, just as I corrected Pastor Ernest, and I told him the correct pronunciation of my name. And by the way, he still hasn't gotten it right, but maybe by the time I leave, he'll get it right. So that's just one analogy I want to bring to your attention, the difficulty with biblical interpretation. We have to go to the author who wrote it, and that's where tradition comes in. You see, I have a long tradition that goes back to Italy, where my ancestors are from, and they pronounce that name one way in Italy. And that was transferred over to here in America when we all came over, and we still pronounce it the same way. So I go back to a tradition to find out how my name was pronounced, and I find out a lot of other things, too, about my ancestors, some good, some bad. But nevertheless, I find out. So tradition is valuable because it gives me the proper interpretation of the scripture that is so important. And you know from common dealings with people and denominations and even in your own church, the Church of Christ, how confusing things can become. Uh, yesterday, Pastor Ernest and I were talking about one movement that happened in the Church of Christ a few, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, in Gainesville, Florida. I know the man who uh, started that movement in your church. And Pastor Ernest said that he was in confrontation with him. And this is about interpretation of the scripture. How do we know what the scripture is saying to us? One man says this, one man says that. They both claim to be men of God. Yet one of them must be in error. You see, now that's where tradition comes in. It helps us, it shows us what the church had authorized as the proper interpretation of a passage. Among all, the pas among all the interpretations that might be possible, there is only one that is true. And this is a very important matter because when we're talking about doctrines in the Bible, we're talking about things that are of salvation. If our doctrine is wrong, 
and I know that you hold to this because I was in your church, if the doctrine is wrong, say about baptism, you don't think the person is saved. So it's a very important issue, isn't it? So we better have the right interpretation. But how do we know we have the right interpretation? How do we know? Now, for that matter, just going on this analogy a little bit longer, John can even be sure my name is Sungenis. I could be posing as someone named Robert Sungenis for all he knows. So how does he know that I am who I claim to be? Now this analogy that I'm bringing up is for the purpose of bringing up the whole issue of the canon of scripture. How does John even know that the book he calls the Bible is indeed the Bible? He quoted many, many times from the Word of God, the Bible, uh, Tuesday night. And we all just took it for granted that this is indeed God's Word. But how do we know? Who told us? Where is it written? Is it written in the sky somewhere? Did we receive a, a divine revelation from God? Or, I mean, what was it? How do we know that it is the Bible? Don't we in life have many documents that pass off as being authoritative and we find out that they're false, that they really don't have authority? Well, maybe the Bible could be that. How do we know? We quote it often enough. Don't you think we ought to be sure about where it comes from and why we know it is the Bible? Now, so how does John know that it is even the Bible? Let's, let alone the interpretation of the passage, how does he even know it's the Bible? He accepts it from tradition. Either the tradition of the Church of Christ that goes back to, say, the 1600s with Campbell and his uh, colleagues, or he has to go back even further to my tradition, the Roman Catholic tradition. Because we had certain leaders that said, here is the Bible, and they passed it down from century to century. Now, John may disagree with that authority, as he has vehemently told us. Nevertheless, how else is he going to prove that this is the Bible? He has to rely on tradition in some sense, and he's relying on his Church of Christ tradition. And that's interesting. When we look at this, we would have to say the very vehicle that John denies as an authority, tradition, is the very vehicle that gave him his Bible upon which he then says that the Bible is his only authority. Now, how, how ironic is that? If John cannot tell us, other than through tradition, that the Bible is the Bible, meaning that John can't get up here and say, well, it's the Bible because it's the Bible. Can't do that. That's no proof. That's no testimony. Yeah, there's a lot of people who say, well, it's not the Bible. There's a lot of people that have different interpretations about this Bible. There's a lot of people that don't believe certain books belong in this Bible. Okay, so who's right? So John has to rely on tradition whether he likes it or not. It's been passed down to him. It didn't drop out of the sky when John was born and God gave it to him and said, okay, now John, go to work. I'm giving you this Bible. I want you to support it. Didn't happen that way. Why else is tradition important for us? Well, we, last night, we, or Tuesday night, we went through a story in Numbers chapter 15. I think this is a very important chapter. And if you have a chance tonight, read that on your own to get the full details. But I'm just going to go through a little bit of it tonight. Moses was presented with a problem, as you know. A man that was caught picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. And Moses, for all his wisdom, you remember God had blessed him with wisdom far above any other man. Even Moses didn't know what to do with him. And so they finally brought him to God. And they said, God, what shall we do with him? A seemingly incidental task. He has picked up sticks on the Sabbath. We don't know whether it's worthy of death or not. Could you tell us? Now, what did God tell them? Did God say, well, hey, I gave you the Bible to read. What are you coming to me for? I wrote my law for you. Are you, you know, are you telling me you're not intelligent enough to go find out what I told you there? 
No, he t didn't say anything like that at all. There was no sola scriptura in that incident. They asked God, and God gave them a direct revelation. He said, stone the man. Now, what do we make of this? Well, number one, we have direct revelation from God in the midst of the Pentateuch that had already been written, or at least par partially up until this point. And they had enough laws back there about the Sabbath to, to know basically what the Sabbath was about and that you couldn't do work on it. And yet here comes this question. And so this tells us that there are certain things that happen in life that even though the scripture may cover in a very general way, and sometimes specifically, it may not cover it specifically enough. And therefore we need help. And we can call upon God, as these Jews did back in Numbers 15. They called upon God and he gave them extra revelation even though they had the written word. Now, when we read the text, we find out that the reason God told Moses to stone him was that there's a difference between presumptuous sin and sin that is not done from presumption. In other words, this man had picked up sticks, and in his heart he had said, well, I'm just going to pick up those sticks just to defy the law. So he was presuming you see, that he could do something, and therefore God knew his heart. God judged him and told Moses to stone him because it was a sin of presumption. Now, only God could know that. The written word couldn't know that. Yeah, the written word talks about our inner heart, but the written word is uh, an entity that has words on it. It can't judge. It doesn't have a thinking uh, capacity. It can't judge between one thing and another. The only, thing, the only entities that can think are you and I. And even then, our, our thinking ability is faulty. And so if we're going to make the right decision, well, we better have some divine help in making that right decision concerning what the Scripture means. And that's basically what this was about in Numbers 15, about what the Scripture means. Does it mean that we have to kill him for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day? See, so it all depends on our interpretation. Let's take a simple command like, thou shalt not kill. One of the commandments. That sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Well, does it really? I'm sure you could sit here and think of many instances where you would wonder, well, how is that applicable? Does that mean that we can't have capital punishment, for example? If someone kills someone else, can the civil authorities kill that person? And in what circumstances would that be allowable? Does that mean I can't kill in self-defense? And what are the parameters of self-defense? Does it mean when he's on my property or not on my property? How about in my car or in a train or wherever it is? Can I kill in self-defense? Does it mean that I'll suffer the same punishment if I kill someone accidentally? And the pressing question we have today, does it mean that I could terminate the life of a newly conceived zygote in the mother's womb without fault? So you see, even the command, thou shalt not kill, though sounding very simple, and the scripture tells us that plainly, needs interpretation. And interpretation can only come from thinking personalities. And if those personalities are going to be in charge of your life, whether you go to heaven or not, they better be darn sure that they're correct. Because if they give you false information, not only will you go to hell, they will too. So a right answer is imperative when we're talking about faith and morals. Let's just take another example, just to draw out the point. You and I are familiar with the doctrine of baptism, baptism by water. We get the information from John chapter 3 verse 5 when Nicodemus came to Jesus and asked him what a man must do to enter the kingdom of heaven and Jesus says to be baptized by the spirit and water. Now here's a puzzling passage. We all know what the spirit is, it refers to the Holy Spirit, but what about the water? Well we've had different interpretations as you well know throughout history about how we apply that water. If you go to the text, John 2 or 3 or 4, it really doesn't tell you how to interpret that word water that Jesus mentions. 
we have many different interpretations. Some believe it's symbolic. Some believe that it's um, uh, just a profession of faith and the water uh, uh, symbolizes that. Some people think it's the word of God because of Ephesians 5.26. And some people actually think that the water is necessary because it's the means of grace. They take it literally. And as a matter of fact, you take it literally. And so does the Catholic Church. But we're what are two of the only churches in the world that see it that way. And if you want to be honest, our interpretation of the water being literal sounds magical, doesn't it? Sounds like, well, you mean water has this power to save me? Is that what you're telling me? And a lot of people don't like that interpretation, so they say, well, no, it's symbolic, like the Baptists do. But they have a plausible interpretation, don't they? Yes, they do, because the text doesn't tell us itself. You can read that all, you know, for your, for your whole lifetime, and you'll never be able to get out of the text whether that water is symbolic or literal. But yet we take it literally. How, how do we know that? How do we as Catholics know that? Well, we, as I said about my name, we go back and ask the person who wrote it, what did you mean when you wrote the word water in John chapter 3, verse 5? Now, the one who wrote it is John, of course, but John is dead. But how are we going to know what John meant? Because we asked John's friends. And John's friends were such people as Polycarp and Ignatius and Irenaeus. And they all said that the water is literal, that the water is not symbolic. And that's how we know. No matter how absurd it may seem to you, and no matter how magical this may make the water appear, that's the interpretation that we accept. That's the, that's the biblical interpretation. That's the interpretation that Jesus wanted us to have. How do we know that? Because the church told us. You see. This is why Jesus gave us an authoritative magisterium to decide these things for us. Not only about thou shalt kill and about baptism, but about every other thing in our life. And that's why Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he says to him, in verse 19, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In the Greek language, all those words that say you, that is, I will give you the keys, they're in the singular. And they only refer to one person, and that's Peter. And note this, he says, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That means God's going to commit himself to this. So if it's bound in heaven, what do we know about God that's going to tell us the surety of this decision? Well, we know that God can't lie. Titus 1.2 and Hebrews 6.13 tells us that. God can't lie. So if God's going to put his name behind this, and he's going to say, whatever you bind, I'm going to bind, and we know that he can't lie, that means whatever he binds in heaven cannot be a lie. And that means whatever Peter binds on earth must not be a lie either. It must be the truth, because God himself is binding it. That's where we get the strength of the Catholic magisterium. That's why it's important. That's why 1 Timothy 3.15, as we saw Tuesday night, says that the church is the pillar and ground or foundation of the truth. And John pointed out, well, yeah, well, 1 Corinthians 3.11 says that Jesus is the foundation. Yes, but that means... If, if John's trying to separate the church from Jesus. No, they're one entity. They're one. Jesus says, this is my body. He's talking about the church. So the church is the foundation as well as Jesus because that's him. That's his church. And so that's why 1 Timothy 3.15 says that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, not scripture. Scripture, as we saw in 2 Timothy 3.16, is profitable for correction and training in righteousness, not the sole authority. Paul never says that. That's why we don't find this, the phrase scripture alone in scripture, because we have tradition and we have the magisterium. Thank you for your time.